We're here with Alicia Bay Laurel. Alicia has actually written a book from the inside, Living on the Earth, about experiences, being, living in communes, in the communal lifestyle. And I feel it's such a wonderful opportunity to have you share with us that experience from the inside. And the, the first thing I'm just dying to ask, because we all think of communes and utopia, the hippie dream and all that. Um, what's the magic there? What's the magic? Did you feel magic when you were there? And what was the source of that? The magic was living with nature. Mm. There was no cement between us and nature. There was no glass between us and the air and the stars. And for me, that was magical. That was, that was a heady potion. So part of it was just the, the rural lifestyle as opposed to a more urban environment and the concrete and glass and pavement. Well, I mean, it's possible to live out in the country and still have a, um, a sort of a more um, consumer-based life. This was a non-consumer-based life. If you wanted to have a house there, you could scrounge together some recycled materials and make something out of them. Or maybe somebody left the community and they would bequeath you their house. That was the case for me. Um, and then food. Well, we had chickens laying eggs. We had a cow that had to be milked every day. Um, there was a community vegetable garden. There were also many individual vegetable gardens. And then people had different ways of getting money, but we didn't spend a lot. It was like grains and beans. We weren't growing our own grains and beans. Since that time, I've had wonderful visits with friends in Japan that do grow their own grains and beans. In their communes? Yeah. Wow. The, I mean, uh, especially up in Nagano Prefecture, there are these wonderful artists living up there that grow their own organic rice and grow their own soybeans and make their own tofu and it's gorgeous. But we weren't doing that because we were beginners and that was why my book exists because we were beginners. Because you wrote I, the manual. <laughs> I was a beginner too yeah. and I realized that everybody needed to know a whole lot more than they knew in order to live in that incredible environment. We were all used to having phones, cars, electricity, running water, and none of that stuff was there. Or, or the running water at the community garden might be the only faucet you could turn on, otherwise you had to take some bottles down to the spring and fill them and take them to your house. And, portion them out as you needed them and make a fire in a little stove and cook your food. So I went around to all hundred of the people who were on the land and I said, what do you know that everybody else on this commune should know to live here? And so everybody had something. I had something. I had spent a semester at Pacific Fashion Institute down here in downtown San Francisco. So I knew how to measure somebody and make a pattern for a shirt or a pair of pants or a dress out of a piece of newspaper and then put that on a piece of fabric and cut it out and make a garment that fit that person. So I did that and I also scrounged a lot of the materials out of the free store say somebody put in a great big dress or an old sheet, right, I could turn that into free fabric. So, so that was part of what I had to offer to the community. So I went around to everybody and I got all of this information. I wrote it by hand, I illustrated it with my line drawings, and by the time I was done, I had 200 pages of writing and drawing. Mm, living on the earth. That was the book. <laughs>
So we've talked about getting back to nature, living out of the concrete jungle, uh, being closer to where your food comes from and participating with the food production. How about the social aspect? How, how close was it to, to you, the utopia that we all hear about socially? Um, there were some aspects of it that were really comfortable for me. One was that you could either live alone in your own house and not see anybody ever if you, that was your choice. Mm -hmm. You could also just go for a little walk and you would run into friendly people. Um, eventually after being there a while you would know some of the people. You could walk over and visit them or they would drop in and visit you. And then every Sunday there was a potluck. So people would come to the potluck. After the meal, those of us that played instruments would get out our instruments and we'd jam together. And if it was winter time, uh, we would have a sweat lodge. And the sweat lodge was a, another kind of bonding because even though it was cold, we'd all take our clothes off and get in there and um, it was, for me, a transcendent experience. So I loved that. And then we had some other kinds of things. We had a flatbed truck and we had a, a school bus for a while. And so we could, for example, all get into the school bus and go to Skaggs Hot Springs and, and take hot baths together there. Or we could all go together to the food co-op and get food in bulk and bring it back. So what we were doing was we were making it so that it wasn't necessary to own a car. I didn't have one. Um, it wasn't really necessary to have a lot of things. What we had was a lot of parties. <laughs> yeah, and the shared resources, of course. You know, right. The vehicle that people could use but not necessarily own. Right, yeah. right. And also, because this was a place where people could come without having to apply, without having to go through a filter. It was land, access to which was denied no one. So there was a wide variety of people there. It was the largest number of people from the East Coast social register I'd ever met in one place. But there were also people that came from slums. There were homeless people. There were people of many ethnicities there. Um, there was some complaint at this uh, conference that the hippie communes were primarily white. Ours was not. Yeah, we had a significant proportion of the community that was people of color. And I think that we all got along really well. And it was also a place where nothing was required. If you wanted to work in the garden, you worked in the garden. If you just wanted to lay around and do nothing, you could lay around and do nothing. There were some people that had exterior streams of income, either from their families or from food stamps or whatever. Um, they didn't have to participate in anything to feed themselves. But we were kind of interested in spiritual resonance and so a lot of us did yoga a lot of us meditated and we gardened also as a just meditative too isn't it? it is so we we had all of these things and what i loved about it was no clocks no calendars so if you woke up in the morning and you say well, I'd really just like to go to, for a hike today. I'm going to hike down the canyon and swim in the little pool, natural pool that's down there. You could do that. Or maybe that day you wanted to go and see a certain friend, and you could go over and see if that friend was available to, to hang out with or, or sew a, a project with or do some gardening with. I mean, it was the most leisure I'd ever had. I, you know, I, I was a, a super achiever uh, student from a very busy, upwardly mobile family that lived in Los Angeles. For me, this was a complete letting go of all of those structures and just experiencing that day as whatever it was. So do you miss it? Of course I do. Wow. Yeah. 
But I have other elements in my life that dictate what's going on. I mean, uh, when I found my true love 21 years ago, uh, he's an avant-garde jazz musician. He's a city guy. And he's also a bit older than I am. So he can't really live that way. And he doesn't want to live that way. We finally compromised on buying this little cottage out in the country in Panama because Panama City has a jazz club where they really want him to play. So he can do that and I can have that and he has learned to love coming out in the evening and looking at the stars and the planets and, and the sounds and the breeze and all of that. So he's, he's starting to appreciate the things that I was appreciative of even as a young child. I was a, a person that was always trying to get out of Los Angeles, you know, if I joined the Girl Scouts so I would be taken hiking, you know, or I'd go to summer camp and all of that connection to trees, to earth, to gardening, to animals, all of that stuff was really important to my well-being. So when I had all of that in my immediate environment, I was feeling really good. So you'd probably go back in a minute if it weren't for your current lifestyle. And yeah. <laughs> and yeah. For the right situation. Yeah. Well, the other thing is I'm getting older, too. Yeah. I'm two years short of 70. And, you know, when you're at that age, you think about other kinds of things. Like, what am I going to do if, if I have some kind of disability that is age-related? Who do I need to have near me or what do I need to have near me? These are things I never thought about in my 20s. Well, it does sound like it was quite an idyllic life for you or that you took very well to it. You enjoyed the communal aspect itself, the social aspect and the rural aspect. Yes. And that, that, that's wonderful. I, I appreciate hearing such a positive impression of that time. And, and just to take a little glimpse at the other side of that coin, what were some of the bigger challenges that you, you saw when you were there and how were they dealt with? Oh, well, I would say different kinds of health problems related to the fact that we were living uh, where it wasn't real easy to have a hot bath, you know, um, and also people were having sex with each other. So um, when somebody would come to the land and they had crabs, you know, or any STD. Or, or STDs. No. They'd get passed around. That was kind of awful. Probably really quickly, I guess, and just because the communal nature. There was one community trip to the Clap Clinic um, using the community bus. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there was. But there you go. That's how you dealt with it. You had a challenge. You got on the bus and went to the clinic. All of us together. Yeah. Everybody that... Oh, I love that. So the challenges were faced as a unit, as a family, as a group. Yeah. 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 Um... For me, uh, there, was, there were moments when it was difficult for me after my book was published. Because when I first came to the land, I was like everybody else financially. We were all broke. And we were all doing the same kinds of things. So much. level playing field. Right. But all of a sudden, I had a, a best-selling book. So I was the, you know, besides Bill Wheeler, the only, you know, the owner of the land, I had money. So some of the people felt like it was incumbent upon them to see what they could get out of me. And that drove me away. Mm -hmm. I just, I felt like somehow I'd been betrayed as a person. I was no longer seen as a person as much as a resource. A resource, the word was right in my head. Wow. Yeah. And so that was sad mm -hmm. for me. But then I went to another commune where I was, I mean, it was a commune of all writers um, in Vermont, and I stayed there for a year, and we wrote a book together. And, you know, they weren't looking at me that way. They were looking at me as another writer, and particularly one that could draw and sing and play guitar. So I was an interesting addition to their group, and it had nothing to do with what I had in the bank. Eventually, I moved 
to Hawaii because I'm a guitarist and I I play finger picking guitar. Um, I was influenced by John Fahey, who was married to my cousin Jan when I was a teenager, and I learned a little bit from him um, about how to play open tunings. And then I went to Hawaii with my mother uh, one the first winter after I was in Maui, and I heard Hawaiian people playing guitar, and I was blown away that it was like what John Fahey did, but it was a completely different aesthetic, and I craved that. So after I left the communal scene, where I wanted to go was to go to Maui and learn to play slack key guitar, which I did. The, the, the history, the foundation of your time with the communal living really just sounds like it left a lasting impact and it, it changed you. It, right. it, it helped you grow into who, who you are, who you became. And you took that to Hawaii. You've taken it, I'm sure, to Panama, obviously. Right? Well, the, when I moved to Hawaii, I lived in a communal household and we had a garden. It wasn't a hundred people like Wheeler Ranch. It was eight people. So eight people sharing a big house that had a big yard and with a lot of fruit trees. That was very nice. And it kind of went on from there. But I was attracted to playing music professionally. Once I got to a certain level, I wanted to move over to the tourist side of the island and work, which I did. The Lahaina side. Yeah, well, Kihei. Kihei? Oh, down there, okay. Yeah, I went to Kihei. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I worked a lot of places, and then eventually I started my own wedding business. And I coordinated weddings, and I did the floral work myself, and, um, and I played music. One-stop shop. So, I, yeah, I sort of became a, a professional flower child. Wonderful. What an inspiration you are. Uh, Alicia, we just thank you for sharing your story. It really is an inspiration because you are giving the positive side of the, the, the hippie communes, the communal living of the, of the 60s um, from someone who was actually there. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, it's just such an inspiration. Like There was some value there. It did work, quote unquote, in a sense, for certain people who made a success of it and that that really says something about why we're sitting here 50 years after the summer of love still talking about it. It was a very, very simple thing. I mean, we were trying to touch the hunter-gatherer thing and the early, early days of agriculture. And there was something about being tribal like that that went very deep. I will say this, most of my best friends from those days are my friends on Facebook. I still talk to them, I still see them. One of them is here at this conference, yep. you know? It's like- We're gonna talk to him too. <laughs> right? But I mean, these people are like my blood relatives. They don't just go away. Wonderful. Like I said, true inspiration, much love and appreciation for your time and sharing these stories. All we right. value from it very much. It really helps us tell a compelling piece that there was some wisdom back then, and it's still alive today, and there's something worth looking at, just yeah. like we're doing here at the symposium. Great. Wonderful. Well, we always love to wrap with a hug. Okay. Thank you.